Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this, this evening. Uh, Delisa, I don't know about that introduction. You make me sound at least 130. Um, <laughs> and age is a problem as we think about doing this. Uh, Davis was my second character. I, I started with a mountain man in Reno named James Beckworth. And the next year, uh, they asked, that was a character they wanted. And the next year, they asked me to come up with a character my second year. And, uh, and I did Davis. That was 1992. So I've been doing Davis for uh, almost 30 years now. Uh, when I started doing Davis, he was 35 because it's the 15th of September, 1947, the day the Air Force starts. So I start, Davis is doing a tour uh, of the country talking about the brand new Air Force. So Senator Symington uh, is sending out a number of officers to talk about, uh, because he's the first Air Force Secretary. He's sending these officers out to talk about, you know, why we need a separate Air Force, you know, what's wrong with the old Army Air Corps, what's going on strategically, what's happening to talk about that. And um, he, so he's, he's 35. Well, I was 43 at the time. Well, now I'm a little older. Uh, he's still 35. So uh, I'll have to, you know, go, go with white side walls, get rid of some of the gray hair here. <laughs> and it'll help a little bit. But anyway, uh, I'd like to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the, give you a little rendition of his life, a, uh, a synopsis of who he is, but maybe for two or three minutes, I could talk about why he wrote the book. Uh, I think that's important. And he wrote the book for himself. He wrote the book for his father. Uh, and those of you who've read it, of course, the introduction, he talks about family life growing up as, a, uh, as an army brat. And then later on, because of his assignments, he had some of the same assignments as his father. He was assigned to Tuskegee. He was assigned to Wilberforce. These are two assignments his father had had over a, a 50 year military career. So he's got some aspects of the family he wants to talk about. Uh, his father, when he graduated from, uh, from, from the academy in 1936, his father, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. was a colonel, there were two black army, two black officers in the regular army uh, in 1936. There were Benjamin O. Davis Sr. and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Those are the only two regular army uh, black officers who were not chaplains. Uh, so they were unique. This was a unique family in a lot of ways. His father asked him uh, at graduation for all of his records and notes from the academy with the admonition, someday someone may want to write about us and I want to keep a good file. So his father was planning on turning over his own papers and those of his son, about whom he expected to do very well. He had very high expectations for this young man. Uh, he wanted to have the record there so this could be done. And I think later, there are a lot of comments. Uh, I understand one of you is very interested uh, in his wife. I don't know a lot about Agatha, but uh, she makes, there are several comments in the book that can be attributed to her. Uh, one particularly telling, uh, she talks about his return to West Point, you know, giving a talk and doing things. And she says she will never be able to forgive the officers, not the cadets, but the officers, the TAC officers who are responsible for the behavior of the cadets when they silenced uh, uh, young young cadet Davis. He was silenced for four years. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the academy and academic life in the military, silencing uh, results when there is a cadet punishment. There, if you break the rules at a military academy, uh, in terms of criminal behavior, you get drunk, uh, you get in the fight. The the at those in those days, what we call the articles of war were the governing body of rules and laws that affected you. That's now called since 1969, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. If you violate the cadet code of honor, which is very simple, we will not lie, cheat or steal nor tolerate among us those who do. That is any violation of the, of the code of honor goes to an honor court that's run by cadets. If you do something that violates the code, but it doesn't violate 
the law of the, uh, the the law, the federal law, the Articles of War, or the now the Uniform Code, then the cadets could punish you. Let's say you beat the rap that you were charged with cheating. Uh, the cadets know you cheated, but it couldn't be proven for some reason. No witnesses were found against you. The cadets would then decide that because you had violated that code of honor, they would not talk to you. So you would be silent, except on official business. So if they had to deal with you as part of the company activities, all cadets are in a company. There are eight companies at West Point uh, in the regiment. So the cadet regiment. So they will talk to you on regimental business or if it's related to school business. But other than that, no one talks to you. Well, after about three weeks, uh, Davis was silenced. There was a meeting of the uh, cadet corps of freshmen. Now that part of the corps, there was a meeting and all cadets were invited. He was busy studying. He was a little late. He got down to the basement of the uh, of, uh, Beast Hall where he was assigned his barracks. And he walked in and they were just, the question being proposed among the cadets at the time was what do we do with this Negro cadet? So he assumed he probably wasn't really wanted at that meeting. So he hears this, that he's not seen by anyone. Uh, he backs out of the room. He had just walked in when he heard this. He backs out of the room and noticed that from that time on, people stopped talking to him. He was reassigned his billeting so that he had no roommate. When he traveled for those four years on official business to games, cadets go to, of course, the Army Navy game, but there are other functions that they go to, training uh, exercises. They do uh, the inauguration, of course, West Point always marches for that. He traveled in a train compartment by himself. Uh, he sat by himself other than eating because you are assigned to a particular table uh, for, your, for your meals in the mess hall, but other than meals and no one talked to him at the dinner table. So for four years, no one talked to him. He says in the book, when he's asked about this that do, during his life, not just in the book, but he says in the book, when he was asked as a senior officer, um, how did you feel about being silenced, about being living this life alone? And he said, no one there, and he means officers and cadets, had any idea how stubborn he was. He was there to get to graduate, to become an army officer, and he wasn't going to let anybody else's behavior get in his way. Well, Agatha says, uh, in a number of different ways, but she comes right out and, and says directly, uh, she's never able to forgive the TAC officers for not correcting this. They were adults. If the cadets decided to do that, fine. These are boys, they're not men yet, they're not army officers, but in a place where over Beast Barracks, by the way, which is the senior barracks where, where freshmen go, uh, over Beast Barracks, the model of the, the core is chiseled in stone. It's duty, honor, country. That if you were dedicating your life to that, and that was part of the oath that you swore uh, in the summer out on the, uh, on the field before Beast Barracks, that that's what you were going to do for the rest of your life, mistreating another individual who was a fellow soldier was not right that they should have known it. And if they didn't know it, they should have been reminded by the officers who were there to govern their behavior. So she talks about that. So it's a book about his father, his family, and, and his dedication to the army. Uh, and of course, uh, about himself. Uh, just quickly about his father before I go on. His father was the first black flag officer in the United States. Uh, he served from 1898 until uh, he was retired in 1941. He was the next day called back out of retirement uh, uh, and uh, went on to serve throughout the Second World War and retires finally in 1948. So from, from 1898 to 1948, he served 50 years. Uh, he, was, um, he did not make colonel for 30 years. He should have been promoted before the First World War. He should have been a colonel about 1915, 1916, when we mobilized for the war. He was constantly passed over because all of the assignments for colonel would require him to command either white troops or even white officers as senior as he was. He was promoted to colonel in 1930. He was promoted to, uh, to brigadier general in, uh, in 1940. So it took him 40 years to make general. Uh, he should have been a general by the end of the, the First World War. So, uh, but that's how long it took given the system 
that, uh, that he was in. And he was a cavalry officer. So cavalry officers, I was armor, which is the, the modern derivation of cavalry. Cavalry officers are always colorful. That you, as long as you remember that, you'll understand lots about who they are, what they do. But anyway, on to his son. Uh, I'll just give you the facts, hard facts to start off with. Uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. was born in uh, December 18th, 1912 in Washington, DC. He was born in his grandfather's home. His grandfather uh, was a worked for the post office and had earlier worked for a federal judge as his valet. So this was a Washington family uh, for quite a while. Uh, his mother dies uh, when his younger sister is born uh, in 1916. So he's, uh, he's six years old when, when uh, his mother dies. Uh, the books say seven, but that's incorrect. He serves from 1936 until 1970. He retires. In that time, he commands a, uh, of course, he's a, he becomes a pilot commands a fighter squadron, a fighter group. Uh, eventually he com commands a, uh, in Korea, uh, he commands a fighter wing and uh, he's the uh, chief of staff of the 12th Air Force in Europe, of the 17th Air Force in the Far East. And eventually he becomes commanding chief of the 13th Air Force in the Philippines before he retires. That is the Air Force that serviced the war in Vietnam. So he commands all of the, uh, the flying uh, apparatus of the uh, the U.S. government uh, in in Vietnam uh, for two years. Uh, then he re retires. Has an interesting career after military retirement. He becomes the chief. If you think about 1970 and uh, hijackings, he becomes the uh, aviation security officer for the Department of Transportation. Uh, President Carter asked him to take that responsibility. Uh, he starts the Sky Marshals, institutes another other other interesting things uh, in terms of security, uh, and then becomes the assistant secretary of transportation. Uh, he becomes the uh, safety, the senior safety officer in the city of Cleveland, which puts him over police and fire uh, and reconstitutes uh, uh, those forces as well, makes them a good deal more military. Uh, if you came to work as a policeman without shiny shoes, you didn't want to cross General Davis. He found out you're in trouble. As he said to them, the day he took over and was sworn in, there's one way to wear a uniform. That's with creases, with shine shoes, and the right attitude. Uh, and he was sort of, a, he was a driven man. He was a driven man in a lot of ways. Well, he dies in 2002, July 4th, the appropriate day for a soldier to, uh, to depart, I would suppose. He's buried at Arlington next to his wife. She dies in March of the same year. So she dies uh, four and a half months before him. Um, he, was, he retires as a Lieutenant General, but he is promoted on the reserve retired list in 1998 by President Clinton to four stars and it's backdated. So he is actually the first black full general uh, or admiral full flag officer in any of the armed services. So before that it was Chappie James who actually served uh, in four-star capacity as our Commander-in-Chief of the North American Air Defense Command. Uh, Chappie had worked for Davis during the war, had been a commander of one of the squadrons when, when uh, Davis gets a fighter group. Well, uh, his math skills were not quite as good as he would have hoped. So before he looked for a, an appointment to the Academy, you, need, you can get a presidential appointment you can get a congressional appointment or senatorial appointment, or if you're, if, if you're the son or now daughter of a Medal of Honor winner, you get an automatic presidential. So you don't really even have to competitively apply. Uh, Davis uh, looks for an appointment in the Cleveland area. He goes to high school in Cleveland. His father is away in the Philippines on assignment when he's in high school. And uh, he's not able to get an appointment there so he moves to Chicago for six months, goes to the University of Chicago, studies math and engineering, because that will help him on the competitive examination. Uh, the, the, the one black congressman in the United States represents the first congressional district of Illinois, which is the middle of the south side of Chicago. So from oh, about 20th Street until uh, 95th in those days from the lake over to the Dan Ryan Expressway, for those of you 
who know Chicago. That's the first congressional district. That was represented by Oscar DePriest, his aunt whom he lived with in, in uh, Chicago, another aunt, one aunt in Cleveland, another aunt in Chicago, knows uh, Ms. Congressman DePriest. And uh, DePriest is very happy to give him a nomination. He does well enough in math. He's accepted in 1932, uh, swears, uh, swears the oath uh, in August of 32 uh, in front of these barracks uh, and is a cadet for four years. He wants to go into aviation. When he was 12 years old, his birthday present, his father for $5 takes him out to Bowling Field, which is now Andrews Air Force Base, takes him out to Bowling Field and he gets a ride with a bond stormer. By the way, $5, understand he's 12 years old. In 1924, $5 was a big present for a 12 year old boy. That was a lot of money. And army officers don't get rich as you can well imagine. He goes up, it's a, it's a 10 minute flight. He is interested in flying and nothing else for the rest of his life. Well, in 1935, the, uh, he applies for the Air Corps and he is told that there are no positions for black officers in the Army Air Corps. That, uh, so he needs to apply for another branch. He has come to the attention, he graduates by the way, 35 in a class of 276, in the class of 36 at 276 members. So being 35th, he's eligible for any branch he wants. So choosing your branch in the army from West Point is based upon your standing in the class. Typically the top cadet by tradition, not required by tradition goes to the Corps of Engineers. So in the class of 1829, Robert E. Lee uh, went to the Corps of Engineers. In the class of 36, Davis's class, uh, the number one cadet was William C. Westmoreland. He goes to the Corps of Engineers. Both of these officers I would point out later on in their careers when war start transfers to combat, they both transfer to combat branches, uh, but they start in the Corps of Engineers. Pershing starts in the Corps of Engineers. So these cadet first captains, the number one cadet, that's typical. Now, after that, you can choose that you can choose the cavalry, the artillery, the intelligence corps, uh, wherever it is that, that you want to go. His standing was high enough to do that. He was denied uh, being able to go to the Air Corps. So he is called in uh, because he won't choose a branch. He refuses to choose. He says, the army won't give me what I want. Let them pick it. Well, for those of you who've been in the military, uh, about 90% of the army before World War I was infantry. Uh, and it's fairly high afterwards, but, but we were an infantry army. That's what we did. You don't choose a branch, trust me, you're going to the infantry. If you were drafted in World War I or, or II and you didn't choose a branch, you didn't decide on the Navy or decide on, uh, uh, on, on the Air Corps or something else, if you were drafted, the chances are you would go to the infantry. That's where you would go. So we were infantry oriented. He wouldn't choose, so you know what happened. You know, he, was, he was sent to the infantry. But in 1935, he was called in by the superintendent of the academy to talk about his career choices because he didn't get infantry, he didn't get the Air Corps and he was very good. The, the commandant's name, that was uh, Major General Fox Connor. Uh, Fox Connor is an interesting guy in his own right. Uh, he was the operations officer for the American Expeditionary Force uh, in Europe. So he was Pershing's brains. He was the G3. Uh, and Connor was a, uh, my opinion, um, and this is a little political. Uh, I think there should be a statue for Fox Connor in front of all of our war colleges, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the National War College, Fox Connor should be there. He discovers Eisenhower, he discovers Marshall, he discovers Patton. Uh, he is absolutely brilliant. He says in his memoirs, if you wanna win a war, there are three things you have to do, and you must do these to win. And I don't see any way around them. If you violate even one of these principles, you will ultimately lose. Never fight unless you have to. Never fight for long. Never fight alone. You can't do any of those things. Fox Connor is well known. He's considered the most brilliant man in the Army. In the, uh, just before this incident with Davis, he is our commander in chief in Panama. His operations officer that he picks is Dwight Eisenhower, who doesn't really read very much. He's interested in playing cards. Uh, and he doesn't, he's a, he's a geographical bachelor. So he invites Eisenhower to join his bridge group and gives him a, a footlocker full of books to read on military history. This is the kind of guy Fox Connor is. 
Fox Connor calls in Cadet Davis and he says, young man, you're not going to go to the Air Corps. My advice to you as bright as you are is that you should request an assignment in one of the combat arms, infantry, uh, cavalry, or artillery, go to a National Guard unit as the advisor, the regular army advisor, go to law school at night. You know, you owe us four years for your education. When you finish your four years, get out of the army, practice law, a, perhaps a career in politics, you're very bright, you will do well. Davis thanks General, General Connor, uh, and uh, he goes on to the army and in the infantry. He's assigned to the 24th Infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia. There are only four places he can go. The regular army since 1865 uh, has four black regiments, the 24th and the 25th Infantry, the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. His father, by the way, by the time he graduates, has served in all four. He has served in the 9th Cavalry. He has served in the 10th Cavalry in the Philippines. He has served in the 24th and the 25th Infantry. Uh, as an officer. So there's no place Davis can go in the Black Army where the NCOs don't know who he is. They will know he's the son of Benjamin O. Davis Sr. And he has some wonderful stories about that. He gets to the 24th, he does well, uh, and he's given a lesson that uh, many young lieutenants have to get. His first sergeant and his platoon sergeant, are they're very friendly with him. They're helpful. They want him to be successful. They know it. They both know his father well. And uh, he comes to work one morning in the orderly room and he comes in and, uh, you know, he says, you know, they, they, they greet him. You know, he's the officer, so he's greeted by the first sergeant and the platoon sergeant first. And he addresses them both by their first names because they're very friendly. Uh, well, this is unprofessional in the military. This isn't done. So the, the first sergeant takes him out behind the, uh, behind the orderly room. They go outside uh, and they have this little chat where he explains to him that there is a code of conduct between uh, officers and enlisted men, and it's for both sides. It's a matter of respect for both. For example, if a, a, a new private comes into the army that sees a four-star general walking by and renders the proper courtesy, which he comes to attention, he salutes, he deserves to get his salute returned. Newest private in the army, four-star general, he gets a salute returned. It is a requirement by regulation and by tradition, and that is enforced. So he's reminded of those sorts of things by these men. They teach him about the army. One of the things he says in the book that's absolutely telling about who this man is, even as a young man, is that there are two things you cannot do in the army or anywhere else for that matter. You can't fool people into believing you respect them or that you like them, because if you don't, they will ultimately find out. Well, in an organization where your life depends upon your relations with people, it depends upon whether you can assess a situation, give orders, and carry through with those orders to get the job done. It is absolutely critical that people understand what your role is and how you feel about them. If you don't like them, they will know. If you have excuses as to why something isn't done, or you do something for your personal benefit, and you don't protect the people within your command, they will know. They will find out you cannot hide it. You cannot hide it, it can't be done. That lesson was instilled upon him as a young man. So after three years, he goes off to infantry with the advanced course. Uh, and since he's already at Fort Benning, he doesn't have to move physically. But before we get to that, when he arrives at his battalion, the custom is for young officers to make a courtesy call upon the commander. Within a month or so, the adjutant of your battalion or your regiment uh, will give you a time and date if you're married, when you and your wife in dress uniform, that is your blue uniform, but it's in the daytime. So with a four in hand tie, uh, when you will report to your, the quarters of your commanding officer and the courtesy call lasts for 15 minutes. It's in the officer's guide. It tells you how it's conducted, what you wear, what you do. It lasts for 15 minutes, uh, somewhere by the front door, inside of the quarters of the senior officer, there will be a small silver bowl. It is called a trivet tray. Into the trivet tray, you put your calling card, which will, for lieutenants, it'll just say Lieutenant. So Lieutenant Benjamin O. Davis, it won't say first or second because hopefully you get promoted fast enough and you don't use the card, you would be throwing money away. Uh, so that you know that it's the right receptacle, 
a calling card will be placed in the bottom of the bowl before you arrive so that you know you're supposed to leave it. And according to military tradition, you should not be seen leaving anything in the trivet tray. So what you do is you put your card, your calling card in the sleeve of your shirt so that as you pass it, you slip it in without being seen. It's done unobtrusively. Well, he reports when he's given the, uh, the time and date uh, for the, the, uh, the call. He arrives at his uh, battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, he arrives at his quarters and the door is open. He can hear children playing in the backyard. He knocks on the door. There is no answer. Uh, he knocks on the door again. He waits. There is no answer. He can hear and see people moving around in the backyard and in the house. Uh, no one answers. So the next day, he waits about 10 minutes. The next day, he goes to the agent and he says, you know, I was there for the appointment. Uh, the door wasn't answered. The, the agent doesn't have an answer. And he says he will reschedule. Well, that call hasn't happened yet. And that was in 1936. So that hasn't happened. Uh, he was not allowed to join the officers club uh, on the base, although he did have to pay dues because that's a requirement. You report into a new base no longer since 1969, that's gone away, but you are required to join an officer's club when you arrive at a post. And of course the post wants all the lieutenants in because it needs the money, it needs the dues. It's a non-appropriated fund. The building belongs to the government, it's free, but all the other activities because it's a private club are based upon, based upon dues, but not Davis. He does not, uh, he's not allowed to join the officer's club. No black officers, he's the only one. So he's, he's not allowed. Anyway, he goes off to the, uh, the infantry school and he does quite well. And what he says, uh, you, go, you go through the school in a cell, there are four of you. And in his cell, when they presented a military problem, you know, you have a sandbox and you've got a battle that you have to arrange the troops, how they should be fought. Of course, you wanna flank the enemy, always better to attack them from the side, but from the front, you wanna get behind them if you can, you wanna use artillery, all of the maps that his cell used were done by Agatha because she was an artist. So they got the highest grades, mostly because that cell had five people. It had four officers and it had Agatha who was drawing their map. She understood uh, the military mapping techniques and the things that were necessary for doing that. So he graduates uh, and uh, by that time, 1940, his father is promoted to, uh, to Brigadier General. And the ninth and the 10th, uh, the two black cavalry regiments, because his father was a cavalry officer, they were consolidated together. They had fought all over the West through the Indian Wars, but they were in separate, but many times companies were at a fort. A company in the cavalry is about 35 men. Uh, so the, a company of cavalry would be at a, a, particular, uh, a particular place, but the, a whole regiment and certainly two regiments were not uh, ever consolidated. So at Fort Riley, the 3rd Cavalry Brigade was consolidated and the 9th and the 10th were the two regiments assigned to the brigade. His father was made the brigade commander. Now, generals, um, no offense for any of you who are very religious, but on battlefields, generals are like God. They can do pretty much anything they want. Generals can pick their staffs. Uh, Colonel regimental commanders, battalion commanders, they don't get to do that. Generals get to pick their staff officers within reason, and they certainly can pick their aide. Uh, so General Davis uh, Sr. decided he wanted his son to be his aide. His son by then was a, uh, had been newly promoted to, uh, to captain, and uh, Davis picks, uh, picks his son. Well, now aides are very important, an aide to a general, because not only do you have the work in the office, that is to keep the general's schedule, uh, his visitors, you get that organized, the correspondence, you get that organized. Um, a brigade doesn't have a chief of staff. So you're really acting like a much more senior officer in some regard. So the officers who need to see the, uh, the commanding general uh, state their reasons. Perhaps a note comes ahead of time as to what is going to be discussed. A briefing is set up, whatever the issue happens to be. So young Davis controls all of that. But in addition to that, you also control the general social life. So you remember those courtesy calls we talked about? You arrange those. And of course, if you're a general, a post commander, regimental commander, there are a lot of new officers rotating in and out that you have to see. So Davis would have to get that organized. One of the problems, I've been a general's aide, one of the problems with that job is you have to get along with the general's wife, with the distaff side of this. Well, now, 
Young Davis had an inside here. He happened to be rather close to his stepmother. He knew what her requirements were, what she wanted. So he had the balance between the office, he knew his father well, and the uh, things had to be perfect. Uh, that was his father. It's very simple. It has to be perfect. And what his stepmother wanted, and he managed to get through this job pretty well. Midway through this, it was announced in Washington after the 1940 elections that there would be Black aviation units created. Uh, the war was starting. We knew that was going to happen. Uh, and uh, so he decides, ah, this is his chance. He goes over at Fort Riley to the the, the, the dispensary, the military for hospital, and he takes the flight physical. Well, he flunks. It's discovered that he's had rheumatic fever, his heart is bad, and his eyes don't seem to be sufficient to pass the flight test. He comes back, of course, and he talks to his father, and he tells him he's flunked the flight test. Now, he got letters all four years at the academy. He's passed his annual physical, never been a problem, no hint, as far as he knows, of any rheumatic fever affecting his heart. Now, remember, there are not that many generals in the Army of those days. Remember Fox Connor, superintendent of the military academy, the man who discovers Eisenhower, Marshall, Patton? Well, he happens to be the head of personnel for the Army at this point. So he's been called back out of retirement by General Marshall, heads personnel, generals all know each other. His father calls Fox Connor. And Fox says, there's been a mistake. Tell that young man to go back the next day and take the exam again. Now, I don't know what Fox Connor did. The next day, Davis goes back to the dispensary, same doctor, same office, same test. He passes with flying colors and uh, is eventually given orders to report the flight school. When he reports the flight school, uh, he, he does very well there. Uh, he is, of course, the he's, he's already a captain. There are other ca there are cadets, that is aviation cadets, men who've joined the army, they're privates. They have to be college graduates if you're black. You have to be a college graduate uh, to be accepted for flight training. He goes, does well. Uh, he is, uh, when he graduates in 41, the end of 41, beginning of 42, he graduates. All captains, regular army, of a date of rank before uh, June 1st, 1940, are automatically promoted to major. The, the army is expanding exponentially at this point. So he's only a captain for about a year and a half. He's a lieutenant for four years, but he's a captain for a year and a half. Uh, and then he, he's a major six months, he's, he's a major. Uh, then he's a, six months later, he's a lieutenant colonel because all regular, and in command. So all regular army officers, majors who are in command, automatically promoted the lieutenant colonel. And the by then the 99th Pursuit Squadron is organized, ready to go. He becomes the commander, uh, commands that for a little less than a year. Uh, and a fighter group, a black fighter group is raised, which has three other squadrons. Uh, squadron is approximately 40 pilots, 25 airplanes that are capable of flying any one time. A fighter group is four squadrons. So he commands a 99th Pursuit Squadron, which is a fighter squadron of a particular type. And uh, the group is the 332nd fighter group with, uh, they go off to North Africa, to, to uh, Europe. They uh, and, and fight and have a very good uh, uh, have a very good record. There's some problems with that, but you'll have to wait till the summer for me to talk about those. Um, I would only say in closing the the general life and description. The when he gets to Central Italy, he's assigned to a place called Ramatelli, and at Ramatelli he is asked. They're flying older airplanes. They fly uh, P thirty nine. Air Cobras, P-40 Curtises, P-47 Thunderbolts. And these are sort of old, used up. They're, they're the second line of aircraft. The P-51 Mustang has come out, which is probably the best fighter in World War II. You have to have a jet engine to fly faster and further than a Mustang. It, it was a, uh, and it's a mistake. The airplane's a mistake. It was really a British design. The British wanted to buy them as um, reconnaissance aircraft. They're fast. They fly high, they get very good gas mileage, Rolls-Royce engine, and, and a, a unique elliptical wing they've designed. They asked North American Aviation to put, the, put these together. North American builds six. The US Air Force, Army Air Corps at that point, gets two of them for testing and decide when the British don't order the, this airplane, they decide, you know, this is what might make a good fighter, we'd better get this. And as it turns out to be the best fighter in the war. 
Davis is called back to Washington a second time. The first time they're going to put them out of business about a year earlier, and we'll talk about that uh, in July. But uh, he goes back to Washington, and a, he is requested by the chief of Bomber Command. Uh, can he do anything with his unit to help them stem the tide of losing bombers? 1943, 1944, early missions, 1,000 bomber missions, we were losing 15 to 20% of the bombers on a particular mission each day. Well, if you keep doing that, you know, we're gonna be out of bombers. And the, the idea of winning the war by strategic bombing is you have to pick these particular German targets, industrial centers, transportation centers, uh, fuel production centers, the oil fields in Poesti, for example, they have to be destroyed. You're not going to have enough bombers to do it if the fighters aren't able to protect them. The P-51 Mustang, P Mustang could fly long enough and far enough to go all the way to Berlin and back with the bombers. All of these other airplanes that we talked about, the P-39 Cobra, uh, the P-40 uh, Warhawk, the, the P-47 Thunderbolt, good airplanes in their own right, but as I say, they're worn out and they're getting secondhand planes in the 332nd Fighter Group. Uh, Davis assures the uh, head of Bomber Command in Washington that if he is given P-51 Mustangs, that his pilots will stay with the bombers, protect them all the way, and they will be able to go to their targets and get back, and we'll have enough bombers to win the war. He gets the airplane. Then he tells his pilots in his briefing that there is no substitute for winning the war through the victory of strategic bombing that he buys the concept. And he says, but here's the problem you have personally. Remember the old army, you can't command white troops, you can't command uh, white officers. Pilots rotate, we started with 50 missions. You fly 50 missions, you live through it, you got to come home. You go to gunnery school, you teach people, other people how to fly, teach them how to shoot, you teach them tactics. You go to schools because you've got this combat experience. Black pilots don't come home. The only way for you to come home is through Berlin. You win the war, you come home. Otherwise you fight and fly until you die. There is no other substitute. So they have to win the war if you wanna to live. To do that, the bombers have to be protected. So he tells his pilots this uh, when he's given the P-51s. When you fly, you fly to protect the bombers. If you leave a bomber to go after an enemy fighter, find someplace else to go to land. You can't come back to the 332nd fighter group. There is no room for you. This is your only mission. It is not to shoot down enemy airplanes. It is not to bomb until the bombing mission is over. Your own bombs that you're carrying on the fighters. It is not to do any of those things. It is to protect the bombers. They did not lose the bomber. Uh, after about six months of this, uh, there were many of the bomber commanders in, in the 15th Air Force in, in Southern Europe, the, the Mediterranean Air Force. Many of these commanders did not know the 332nd fighter group was black. All they knew is that they didn't lose bombers and they didn't leave you. So they see a German fighter plane go. Remember, fighter pilots get their glory by shooting down enemy fighter planes. If you, are, you shoot down five, you become an ace. One of the things you get as an ace, you can take your flight jacket to the tailor and the tailor puts in a bright red liner so that wherever you go, when you hang up your, your flight jacket, everyone else knows you're an ace. That's what's important to fighter pilots, except in the 332nd fighter group. I will end there. That's who Davis was. Yeah. That's what he you. did. You know, we do have some questions, and um, I, I, I want to start questions? with one really? that... Oh. Um, we can answer this questions. This is a lot of detail, and the book has a lot of detail. So we have a question. Did he keep a diary or a journal to remember all of the? He details? kept notes. His wife kept the diary, as I understand it. As I say, I don't know a lot about her. She kept the diary. I don't know if it was complete, but some of the quotes that we have in his book, I believe, come out of her diary. Uh, he did keep notes, though. And his father kept notes and records of, of his son's career. His father lives till 1967. He's 93 when he dies. That's right. So um, another question that came in related to that is, did he have a, a co-author that helped with writing this book or was he really- I would suspect that there was a shadow writer in there somewhere, but I don't know that. I don't have any, uh, uh, any hard information, but that's typical with, uh, with non-academic writers. The, the publisher wants to make money. Uh, 
Right. So I, I would not be surprised, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. But the words are his. I mean, if you listen to, if you can find video of him talking, this is who this man is. So here's a question that, that I think points to how you came up with the character. So um, Dorothy said, um, having studied the autobiography, um, how do you portray his personality and his disposition? Because he says many times that he was angry about the racism, um, but he always seems very composed and quick to appreciate other people's good qualities. So what, what do you, how, how do you figure out that disposition for your people? Davis has a nephew named McNichols. And when McNichols was a boy, uh, he was talking to his uncle. And what, uh, what he's told is that if you have to show you're better than other people to do what you want to do by having them on their knees, then you're not a good person. That's who he was. What he saw was the way to fix these problems was to perform well. Now, unfortunately, for those who work for him, they had to perform well, too. Remember I told you working for his father, there was one thing you did. It was perfect. Whatever you did, it had to be perfect. He only wanted the number one job. That's who his father was. That's who he was, who he became, what he expected of the people who worked for him. Now, remember, back in the United States, there were people who said, now, this will, you will laugh at this, that we've given you, pilot, combat pilot, a $35,000 airplane, the latest, $35,000 was a lot of money, 35, that's a lot of money. And it was considered by many Americans that Black pilots, one, were not very smart, not well coordinated, and for some reason couldn't fight at night. Now, I'm not quite sure where this night thing comes from, but these were beliefs. You'll see this in newspaper stories. This is in the investigation that was conducted while Anzio was going on. Uh, so Davis is not at Anzio with, his, uh, with, the, with the 99 Pursuit Squadron. He's back in Washington defending the unit to keep them in business. It was that they had more sick days than other units. They didn't perform as well as other units. But when they put the numbers together, this was a senatorial investigation conducted by the junior senator from Alabama who said those planes should be given to white pilots who would go out and kill Germans with them. Uh, and they shouldn't be allowed to this experiment, this social experiment was a waste of time. Well, in the first two days over Anzio, seven German planes were shot down the first day by the, the uh, 99 Pursuit Squadron. And, uh, the, and this was in the newspapers at home. The, senior senator, the junior senator from Alabama, who was now being questioned because Davis is having to respond to these questions, uh, shows in the newspaper. What he said is anybody can get lucky. You had a good day, so what? It's still a bad idea. The next day they shot down eight planes. There were 35,000 men on the beach who saw the fight in the air over them. That ended that, that discussion, but I'll talk about, in July, I'll talk about that some more. It's an interesting story. Uh, like he yeah. knew that the way home for his men, if they're gonna survive, was through Berlin. You win the war, you get to go home, wasn't gonna happen any other way. He knew that things would change if these men performed well, and he was going to make sure that they did that or died trying. Um, I want to pause and just remind people that you can put questions in the chat, but I'm going to ask you, Star has a, a pretty specific question, and it's about when Davis was in Japan and Tokyo. Uh, she said he really seemed to enjoy his time there. Did he mention at all the strike between Japanese and Chinese? Well, he talks about that a little. And of course, when he leaves Japan, he goes to Taiwan. He's not only the American Air Force commander there, but he is the first UN commander of all forces, air and ground, on Taiwan. So he certainly understood that. Uh, and uh, but he was able to work with people in many ways. He's a he's a military diplomat, and you know there, there are a number of noted military folks who have diplomatic or quasi diplomatic jobs to do. And he performed very well in those functions. So he performed as a pilot. He performs as an admin officer. The Air Force demonstration team, the Thunderbolts, he was the principal staff officer in 1950 who put that together. So whatever job he was given, he did a good job at. And he understood people. He did a, uh, you know, just a wonderful job at that. Now, of course, being in Japan, it will also make you happy. He had an MG car. Uh, that he had uh, sent over from England that was robin's egg blue, which was Agatha's favorite color. 
So that may have had something to do with him doing well in Japan. <laughs> so, um, As an aside. <laughs> This question um, speaks more to other servicemen, not just his attitude, but um, in relation to his poor treatment at Fort Knox, mm -hmm. he said, I had a mission to perform. But can you talk yes. about Black servicemen finding a, a mental and emotional way to serve the country, even while during, being treated badly by military and by civilians? During the war, Black servicemen referred to themselves as Tan Yanks. And the Tan Yank you remember the, the V for victory, the Churchill flash? Mm -hmm. Well, that was fairly common throughout the Allies. You know, other, Churchill is well known for that, but that was the sign that was given the V for victory. The tan Yanks greeted each other and they turned the V both ways. And what that meant was double victory. We're gonna win over fascism and the Nazis. We're gonna win over segregation and mistreatment in America and at home. Nice. So they knew they had to get a job done so that uh, they would be recognized. Okay. So the double V it was called. Now, two people asked, I know you've talked a little bit about his, um, that he went to high school in Cleveland and you mentioned Wilberforce, but is, since we're, since we're in Ohio, a lot of people, not everyone on the calls in Ohio, but a lot of us, is there any other um, interesting things to, to tell us about his Well, he was an assistant military or? professor at Wilberforce, and, but he was also there as a younger man because his father was the professor of military science. So he's there living on the campus and knew the campus. And that was true in Tuskegee as well. So at Tuskegee, he actually lived in the same house he'd lived in as a boy, because that was the house assigned to the military science professor. His father had had the house, so he grew up there. And when he goes back as a faculty member, he's living in the same house and plays cards. He's a great card player, as many officers were in those days. You, you could play bridge for no money. You could play bridge. That was considered socially acceptable. And Eisenhower says, you know, many, much of his promotion was based upon being a good bridge player. He got to know other senior officers who protected his career. Um, Davis talks about the good times he had at Wilberforce and at, uh, and at Tuskegee on the faculty and being there with his father. Those were communities in which he felt safe, warm, accepted. Uh, these were the only black middle class people he knew were at those universities. So he certainly had that nexus of good feeling uh, in those kinds of communities. So John Anderson's asked, um, was Davis ever wounded in battle? Davis was not wounded. not wounded. He flew 60 combat missions and shot down four aircraft, four German aircraft. Okay. And of course in Korea, he flew, he was a fighter group commander there he flew, he transitioned the jets in 52, and uh, he was a F-86 pilot, the uh, Sabre jet, the famous Sabre jet. You gave me a great transition because I was just going to ask a question about Korea. Um, so uh, Dorothy asked, in his time in Korea, it seems so peaceful, even though it was the time of the Vietnam War. And she was Well, no, now Korea, he's it? there doing the Korean War. Okay. So he's at the end. So in 54, he's there 53, 54. Uh, and at the end of that, he's promoted to Brigadier General. Okay. So he's there doing the end of the Korean War. It's beginning to wind down. Okay. Okay. Now he well, was in the Philippines during the last part of uh, his service where he commanded the 13th Air Force, which was the controlled our That's the tactical Air Force fighting in Vietnam. Okay. Does that cover your question, Dorothy? It is there more I can say on that? You have more? Um, I, I guess I thought he went back to Korea. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, he served again in Korea as the chief of staff of the 17th Air Force, then, then goes off to Europe for five years with the 12th Air Force. He's chief of staff, then deputy commander, uh, then goes to, then go, goes to STRATCOM. The strategic, uh, the predecessor of the strategic air command was called STRATCOM in those days, just strategic command, not air, and where he's chief of staff, then deputy commander. But at that time, he's also commander of the Asia, uh, Middle East, Asia, and African U.S. Air Forces, which includes Korea. So that comes under his command as the deputy commander of STRATCOM. So literally everything outside of the United States was his, everything inside uh, belonged to uh, General Dillard, who was the uh, commander in chief of STRATCOM. 
and actually uh, you're saying that just reminds me, um, maybe you could comment how he and Agatha seemed to feel like even though they were serving the United States that they were always happier when they were outside of the United States? Oh, I can certainly tell you not only that they feel that way, that was very common among soldiers. In the late 60s, early 70s, uh, many black soldiers would volunteer first to go to Germany because uh, they didn't want to be in the South. Most of the combat army was in the South because land was cheap. That's where the army had large bases. And that was true since the Civil War because these were places put together for federal troops occupying during the period when the Southern states were out of the Union. So they were part of military districts. So Virginia, for example, is military district one. Uh, Texas is military district nine, I, as I remember. Uh, so large forts were put there so that this was an army of occupation until these states, uh, was it two thirds of the white male population uh, swore an oath of loyalty to the union so they could come back into the union and resume statehood. So these were not places where off post it was particularly friendly to black soldiers. They would go to Germany, be treated better and they would do things to stay. They would extend you know, the period of time there and there are ways to do that. I served in Germany, late sixties, early seventies and uh, that was a lot of my soldiers felt that way. And it was very comfortable living, uh, living in Germany. And back there again, 10 years later, at the same area because I liked it, you know, and enjoyed it. So yeah, many, many soldiers felt that was very common. That was not unique, unique to them. And for those reasons, if you consider where the military is stationed. Here's a, an interesting question that John Anderson put in here. Did Davis have the ear of President Truman when he was making the decision to integrate the military? Was his advice um, sought or- He's way too junior. Okay. He's way too junior. Okay. He's a Colonel. Yeah, the, uh, yeah unless you knew, you know, the president, you weren't going to, uh, uh, no, no one at that level was gonna have that, uh, uh, that. Now he did have the ear after he came home uh, in, 40, in early 43, he came home to defend against this uh, congressional, uh, this the senatorial investigation. Uh, he had the ear, Hap Arnold sat next to him at the hearings. So you've got a, uh, you know, the chief of staff of the Army Air Corps comes as a four-star general uh, who comes and sits down next to you. That indicates where Arnold stood in terms of supporting Davis. Now, I am not so sure Arnold thought that having resources dedicated to a unique black unit, because remember now, we have to train black pilots separately. We have to train black gunners separately. We have to train black uh, mechanics separately. It was sort of like a second black air force. Well, if we look at this now, we'd say, hey, that's a waste of resources. We've got one gunnery school, let's send all gunners there. We've got one flight school, let's send all pilots there. So from an efficiency point of view, I'm not so sure Arnold thought this was a great idea, but he knew this was one of his men who had done the job he'd been assigned to do. And like a good soldier, he was gonna support him. The FM 101-5, which is the field officer's guide, uh, and, and the Air Force uses the same book. It was the same organization. Uh, in uh, chapter two, it gives command responsibilities and it starts with this. A commander is responsible for everything his unit does or fails to do. Everything his unit does or fails to do. You can delegate authority. People can work for you. They can do things for you. You cannot, by law, you cannot delegate responsibility. Hap Arnold is responsible for what the 332nd Fighter Group does. He's delegated the authority to this man who is doing an outstanding job. He's shooting down German planes. He's defending the bombers. And of course, the performance over Anzio, the first two days of the invasion, uh, that's second to none. And you've got the witnesses of the men on the ground who see the German planes pulling away and being shot down. Arnold's going to back him up, as he should have. Yeah. Are there other questions? I don't think I missed any from earlier. Um, Give people a minute in case they're typing. Sure. Yeah. 
we're really excited to um, hear the full th- more of the story because there's there's just so much to his story. It's just fascinating. So yeah, I'd like to make a yeah. formal request now. I want two hours on stage. <laughs> It'll get dark because we're outside and that is a problem. <laughs> I'll talk faster. Our, our Q&A is sometimes the, you know, it's getting darker and darker as it comes along. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So let me just remind people uh, and and tell you a little bit about the summer when when we'll actually get to see Jim uh, face to face. Um, we we do have one more book talk, so don't forget that uh, Kevin Radiker will be joining us on Zoom May twentieth for the book The Splendid and the Vile. Um, so we'll get to hear about Churchill, uh, and uh, that'll be on May twentieth. Don't forget to Alicia. I'm sorry. Out- who's oh, Churchill? Yeah. Who's Churchill? Who's this that? A tiny character. Did he fly? Did he fly? We like to pick obscure characters like Churchill every once in a while so that we <laughs> so that we educate people. Um, we will send out a survey and um, this, I think she maybe just did the survey link right there. Um, so if you click on that, it'll open up in another window and you can just go in and fill it out because we need this for our grants um, and grants are what helps us uh, keep Chautauqua going. So we would appreciate that. In the summer, we're going to be at the band show, uh, as far as everyone's plans are right now, we're going to be at the band show in the evenings, live, um, hoping for beautiful weather. So that'll be July 13th through the 17th. The way we're going to do the workshops will be a little different. And so I'm going to just start talking about it now. The youth workshops, and there will be four of them, those will be face to face because we're going to try to give them an experience that's not in front of a screen because they've done a lot of that in the past year and a half. But the adult workshops will all be done virtually. The, uh, the adult locations in our town are just not ready to commit to face-to-face events. And I understand that. So we will be trying to reach out to people like you <laughs> to join us in a virtual um, afternoon workshop or a few or morning workshops. And you'll hear more about that as we go. Uh, you can always go to our website, which is uh, www.ashlandchautauqua.org. And on the website, you'll be able to find all sorts of um, scheduling events. Uh, you can, if you're new to us, you can hear about our past. Um, so be sure and uh, check that out. And the links to the YouTube videos, and we, we have our own Ashland Chautauqua YouTube channel now, but those links will be accessible through the website as well. So it's sort of one-stop shopping for you to find out how the summer is developing, um, when you're going to get to actually uh, meet Jim and uh, hear more about Benjamin O. Davis, uh, along with John Anderson doing Hemingway and Karen Branch doing Gertrude Bell, um, George Frying doing uh, Remark, and then we'll have Ken and Radiker finish things up for uh, our Churchill performance. So we've got quite a week planned for you. Thank you for coming. Please fill out the survey. Come back on May 20th, uh, and we appreciate everyone's support. Have a good night. And thank you, Jim, for your look forward to seeing you in July. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll get warmed up by then. (laughs) You get really warm at the band show. It can be pretty hot. (laughs) I'll bet. (laughs) Bye bye. You take care. Good luck with your foot. I hope it mends quickly. (laughs) Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for coming, Ron, Doris, Cora. Catherine, (laughs) good night.